Our lovely folks at YouTube, Ren here. So we are outside on this uh, slightly chilly spring day, early spring day in February. Um, I am currently in the process of making black walnut ink. Um, now the black walnut tree is native to the eastern U.S. Um, Joglans nigra is the uh, genus name on that one. Uh, it does make these large tennis ball size sort of greenish yellow fruit in the fall. Um, that eventually will darken to sort of a brown color. The fruit is actually the part that we're using. Uh, inside the fruit is a walnut, the black walnut. It is edible, just like um, the English walnut, which is a walnut that we usually buy in stores. Um, however, the shell is very, very hard. It's very difficult to crack. It's very hard to get the nut out in one piece. That's why we don't typically see them as much in the grocery stores, but they are just as edible and just as delicious as the standard English walnuts that we eat. Um, however, in this case, we're using the fruit and not the nut. Now, um, walnut is also commercially grown for its wood very frequently. It is a very popular, very expensive wood. Uh, it is the heartwood that is usually used on this tree. Uh, it makes a very dark, has very, very nice pattern to it. Um, very easy to work and very highly prized in woodworking crafts. Um, however, in this case, yeah, we're not using the wood, we're not using the nut, we're using the fruit. I am using gloves because it will stain. That's why it makes such a good ink. Um, now, the compound that makes the dye is called juglone. It, uh, and you can see, these are some of my fruit here that I've saved from, um, from the fall. They have dried out and hardened. They make this nice brown color. Uh, that brown color is from the juglone in the fruit. Juglone is an allelopathic chemical. What that means is this is actually a little bit of bioterrorism that the walnut produces. Uh, it prevents other plants from growing around it. For that reason, I don't have a walnut tree in my yard. However, I have a friend who does, um, and uh, my grove mate is the one who gave me these walnuts. They always have an abundance of walnuts that they do not want littering their yard and they gave me free reign to pick up as many as I wanted. So uh, the nice thing about these walnuts as well, in addition to the juglone, which makes the dye, they are also a natural source of tannins, um, which means that in addition to using this as a dye, you could also use it, uh, or as an ink, you can use it as a dye for dyeing fibers. Um, the tannins make a natural mordant. Um, if you're not familiar with fiber dyeing, uh, a mordant is basically the chemical that makes the color stick to the fibers. Um, because they produce their own tannins, they have their own mordant within it. You don't need to add anything to it in order to be able to dye yarn or other natural fibers. Just the walnuts themselves do everything they need to do. So, you can see I am working outside. I do have gloves on. This will stay. Um, the reason I'm outside is because it does have kind of a unusual smell to it. It's not necessarily unpleasant, but it's not something that I want my house to smell of. It, um, it kind of reminds me of like if someone combined mint and olive juice, that's what it smells like to me. Um, obviously everyone's going to be a little subjective in what they smell. It's not unpleasant, but it's not something I want to have my whole house smelling of. That's why I'm working outside with my camp stove. Um, now this has actually been soaking for some time. So basically you're going to take your fruit. It doesn't matter whether they're green, fresh, or black like this one. Uh, either way it will work. It will turn that brownish black color as it oxidizes or it gets exposed to air. So um, you can speed up the process by taking a rock or a brick or a hammer and kind of breaking these open, breaking these fruits into pieces. I do mine the lazy way. I just chuck the whole thing in there and just let it sit. Um, you can sort of bring it to a boil to help to kill off some of these mold spores off of them if you want to do. Just bring it to a boil, put a lid on it, and then let it cool with the lid on. Don't open it because that will expose it to uh, bacteria. That's <clears throat> actually called the Pasteur method. That's one of the ways that Louis Pasteur used to pasteurize things. Um, but you can also just leave it be. Any mold that grows on the surface, it will get nasty but you can literally just scoop it right off. Before I started this today, or restarted it, I should say, there was a big, thick mat 
of blue-green mold on the top that I literally just scooped off and threw into my compost heap. Not a big deal. It's fine. It does not make any make any difference to the finished product. So um, you're going to want to soak your fruit in the water, at least enough water to cover, maybe a little bit extra, for about a week or more, um, just to make sure that you're getting out as much of that uh, juglone as you can. Once they've soaked, you can then strain those walnut and walnut pieces out. Um, I have a little plastic strainer I got at the dollar store that I use for that, as long, along with a, a set of scrap fabric. Uh, one thing I do want to warn you as well, any materials that you're using for this, your pot, your strainer, funnels, anything like that, make sure that they are dedicated exclusively for dye making. I got this, I think, at a thrift store. This came from the dollar store. I wanted to get things that were inexpensive and that would be used exclusively for dye making or other inedible things. I do not want to use my cooking pots for this because then they're not safe for cooking in anymore. So use your own exclusive dye making or ink making materials for this. Um, so this is actually just about coming to a boil here. And you can see I'm just using a pruning stick from my garden to kind of stir it up. Now I'm testing to see when it reaches where I want it to be. I have a little paintbrush here and I just kind of dip it in here and I have my little paper here that I'm testing it with. And I will show you this. So you can see that each mark is sort of getting successively darker and we're actually pretty close to the color I want it to be. So. I think that pretty soon what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to, once it gets, you know, it's at that color I want it to be, um, I'm going to take it off of the heat here, let it cool down, and then we're going to bottle it in jars. Now, I actually already have my jars already prepared here. So this is a little jar I got at the craft store, um, just a little flip top jar. It cost me less than $2. Um, I've already pre-measured these. Each jar actually holds... 225 milliliters. Yes, I'm using the metric system. English system is terrible. So since I know that this jar holds right up to that line on the neck is 225 milliliters, I've already pre-added 10% of that volume or about 20, well, I fudged up 25 milliliters in isopropyl alcohol, okay? That alcohol is our preservative for the ink. It's to help prevent the mold from growing on it after we've uh, put it in the jars. And then to that alcohol, I've also added just a little bit of ground cloves, um, which also helps to act as a preservative as well. If I've had whole cloves, I would have preferred to just add a single whole clove to this. Um, unfortunately, I just repackaged my whole cloves into a new jar, and now I can't find that new jar. So I have too many jars, y'all. But ground cloves will work in a pinch as well. And it's literally just a pinch of ground cloves added to that. Um, that will also help to make the fragrance a little more palatable for the ink. So yeah, this is this is boiling nicely. We are just about done here. So um, I'm probably going to try and track down my funnel and let this cool off. And then uh, we'll talk some more in a little bit. Okay. So, uh, my ink has cooled off. It's still a little warm, but it's more like a, sort of like a drinkable tea temperature rather than being boiling hot. So I'm going to start putting it into my jars now. I've got one that I've already started here. I could not find the funnel that I had bought for this purpose, so we are improvising. I have a little old plastic cup that we are repurposing for this, and I'm basically just going to use that as a scoop. Now I want to make sure every time before I scoop it that I am stirring my ink up because there are some precipitates, just that uh, that inky dye color will sort of like sink to the bottom. So I want to make sure that I'm stirring it up before I scoop to make sure that I'm getting an even amount of color in each jar. I'm just going to pour it right up to that pre-measured line that I'd already predetermined as being the top, right there. Uh, bottling this while it's still a little bit warm will also help to prevent any of the, the icky growth that you may get. Ideally, we should have enough alcohol in there that we wouldn't have to worry about it, but better safe than sorry. Now, 
although I am using this as a dye, as an ink. I keep wanting to say dye, because usually what I do is I dye. <laughs> I dye I, uh, I'm a yarn person. I do a lot of knitting and crocheting, and I have been making a lot of my own homemade dyes for my yarns, and walnut is definitely one that is a very easy one to use as a dye. If you wanted to dye yarn with this instead of making an ink out of it, basically where you get to that step where you're at the right color that you want, rather than taking it off the heat, you would just let it down to a simmer, and you would have some pre-soaked yarn that had already been soaked in warm water, sort of at the same temperature as your, um, as your dye bath. You take the yarn out of the water, add it into the dye bath, and just let it sit there and simmer for about 30 minutes to an hour, at which point you can then take it out and uh, start rinsing it in successively cooler, you know, start with warm water and then get it successively cooler until you get it um, to a handle, to a good cool temperature, and also to the point where the dye is no longer rinse and free. And it should leave behind a permanent warm brown color on your yarn. I'm going to have a lot more here than I actually have jars to fit it in. So I might have to get a couple more jars, or maybe a larger jar for my own self. Um, these little jars that I have here, these are actually for my grove mate. So, surprise! Y'all are getting some walnut ink. Uh, now, as for what I would use this for, um, if you have a grimoire or a book of shadows, this would be an awesome ink to use, to write that with. Um, for spell work, you can use it for writing out your intentions on little slips of paper, things of that sort. <clears throat> Um, the caveat is that you cannot use a fountain pen with this, um, because it does have that kind of sediment, gunky stuff in there. It will clog up a fountain pen if you happen to be a fancy calligrapher. So, but you can use a calligraphy dip pen, and oh crud, I just got ink on my finger. Oh, well, hopefully it's not too bad. You can use a dip pen, or just if you don't want to invest into anything fancy, just a regular old paintbrush is fine for this. My gloves off too soon, folks. And here we are. I'm going to have a little brown spot for my hands now. That's the price I pay. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, these are going to finish cooling down and then they are going to get labels. Make sure you label. Always have labels on all your jars because come three months from now, you will forget what that is. <laughs> so, yes, very important a label on it, especially if you're going to gift it to someone else. Make sure it has labels on it. And I really need to put my gloves back on before I hand it these again. But, uh, but yeah, that's basically it. That's my walnut ink right there, all ready for gifting. So I hope that uh, the people who receive this are going to enjoy it, and I hope that you've enjoyed this video. And uh, I hope you get some use out of it. Make some use out of those walnuts. Oh, where's my little thing? Here we go. So, um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs>